Thanks for tuning in today. I'm Dr. Nick, the incrementalist. Join me as I seek out the small incremental changes being applied in other industries that we can learn from and that can be applied in healthcare. Can these changes bring immediate value, but also add up to the big improvements and revolution we need in healthcare? Come along with me to explore the possibilities. My innovative guests from around the globe have used small incremental improvements to achieve their moonshot. And today, as I am each and every month, I'm joined by my colleague, Craig Joseph. He's the Chief Medical Officer at Nordic Consulting Partners, and we're covering news you can use for the month of August 2022. Craig, thanks for joining me. It is my pleasure as always. So uh, we should kick off talking about COVID-19. We've uh, reached a another inflection point. Uh, this one, a change to the vaccination uh, choices. We've got boosters, but now we've got some, A, a new vaccine, Novavax, but also the uh, vaccines for uh, the additional Omicron. What do you, what's your take? Well, I, you know, I, I think it's exciting. We were going back and forth here in the U.S. about a, a fourth booster. Um, certainly that's been available to people who have uh, significant medical problems and anyone over 50, at least in the U.S., could get a fourth booster. Um, but now we're looking at, and that was the same booster, that was the same vaccine that we've been given since, uh, since they, they came out. Now we're looking at with the Omicron-specific vaccines, they have both the um, uh, vaccine to help protect against the uh, original strain, but also some of the newer strains that are the, have become the, the virus that's uh, that's attacking all of us nowadays. So I think it'll be uh, it'll be good. You know, this is all new, and um, I think it took about two months based on you know using that mRNA uh, functionality, which is again very very quick. Um, but, you know, they're just making slight changes because the virus just makes slight changes. And so, you don't. it doesn't take that much to get to, uh, to get some, some new vaccines. So I think it'll, it sounds like it's going to be available to everyone in the United States starting this fall. It's, it, I think most uh, scientists are predicting that uh, this will be a, probably an annual event um, that we'll be getting, like we get a flu shot every year, we'll be getting a COVID shot every year. And um, ideally, if possible, those would both be in the same syringe. So when you go for your flu shot, you're really going for your flu slash COVID vaccine. Who knows? That's that's it's something fun to talk about. But boy, uh, things change very quickly here in COVID land. Yeah, it's funny. I, I, I can't say that there are many people that say fun to talk about when they're talking about having vaccinations and jabs. But OK, there's the pediatrician talking because it was we his primary them. activity. We love them. Come on, Dr. Nick. Yeah, we love vaccines. You know why we love vaccines? Because we don't like treating uh, kids with um, for diseases that are, are preventable. That's why. And so, yes, much in the same way. Um, I think this is something though that people are still struggling with: is that COVID vaccine is not intended, was never developed to prevent you from getting COVID. You know, if it does that, that's terrific. Uh, but really, it was per- it was to prevent you from dying of COVID. It was to minimize your risk of ending up in the hospital with COVID. And, and if you, much like the flu shot, you know, the flu shot was never intended to tell people, oh, once you get the flu shot, you'll never get the flu. No, we never, we never said that. What, what we, what I hope people were saying, I know something what I said uh, when I was giving these vaccines to children and adolescents was, um, if you get the flu, you will, statistically speaking, have a much better time of it. You will not be as sick for as long. And if you have asthma or other respiratory type problems, you will um, are much less likely to end up in the hospital. Um, and, and that's the goal. And so, again, kind of resetting those expectations. But as this uh, COVID, as these, uh, the, the virus um, mutates and changes a little, uh, we do have to keep up with that, just like the flu shot. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting. And, you know, you highlighted the point, the two months. But let's be clear, it wasn't just two months for the development. It was two months to develop and scale it to deliver large numbers of doses. As you rightly said, uh, it will be available. Let's hope the uptake is uh, better than we've seen with the boosters. 
um, I believe running it at about 30%, which, you know, is a little bit uh, sad given uh, it's such a protective uh, opportunity for those people that should be taking it, particularly in the older age groups. A couple of points to note that I think are important. Uh, you know, uh, the, the, the guidance is clear that even if you've had booster booster, which, you know, double boosted, you are still eligible uh, to get the covalent vaccine. So that doesn't preclude you from. I think the other thing that was interesting about the previous vaccines, you know, it wasn't that we were misled. I think we were spoilt a little by the fact that they were so good, so much better than certainly the flu vaccine, at, you know, these astounding levels of protection, 95%, which, you know, some people translated, as you rightly said, into, yeah, you're not going to get it. Um, and importantly, that carried through multiple variants that we saw right up until Omicron. I think Omicron has been the one that's really taken a, a, a dive in terms of the effectiveness of these previous vaccines, which is why this is urgent. I, I will counter the, the position of the sort of annual. I think that may be true, but I think there's a couple of reasons why it might not. I think the coronavirus is more susceptible uh, from a targeting standpoint, the general coronavirus is not just SARS-CoV-2, but generally they are more susceptible to a broad spectrum uh, vaccine if we could find one and develop one. So there might be some potential to actually get persistent immunity to all coronaviruses. And it, interesting, uh, not a lot or well, not as much research as I think we would like to see for the nasal version of this, which is where there is some tremendous opportunity to apply better protection because when you get the jab, you don't get as much protection in the nasal cavities, yet that's where we really need it, or at least as we understand it. So there's some opportunity that you maybe don't have to have the jab, but have to inhale. Anybody that's had anything like that will know it's a pretty miserable taste at the end of the day because it ends up in your mouth, or at least that's been my experience. But um, I, I think good news and um, it will be available soon. And I'll certainly be accessing it for my own purposes um, and for, for for our family as well. So I think that's great news. Moving on, um, we, uh, we, we've seen more movements with Amazon. So uh, Amazon uh, purchased one medical, uh, but then they said they're getting rid of Amazon Care and Care Medical. What is going on? Uh, well, you don't, please don't ask me. I was going to ask you. Uh, <laughs> so Amazon uh, just announced uh, this week that uh, Amazon Care would be closed down by the end of the year. And a lot of people will be out of work looking looking for a new job. Um, you know, primary care is hard. Uh, there was an article in uh, one of the newspapers uh, very recently about some concerns that some of the Amazon Care employees had right. regarding um, the tech. Ironically, regarding the technology that that they were using, their electronic health record. There were some folks that were not happy with with it and. And, um, you know, some of the other, you know, basically some of the concerns from inside. And again, I don't know how accurate these are. It could be a small percentage of, of people, but, you know, concerns that the company was more interested in, in profits and um, uh, kind of growing their practice than, than taking care of patients. Now, everyone can say that every hospital and healthcare system uh, is, is in business, no, no margin, no mission. Uh, but it, it is, um, it is different. Healthcare is very different, and and Amazon won't be the first tech company to um, admit, after spending a lot of time and money, that uh, healthcare in the United States is 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 very complicated and and not as easily as disrupted uh, disrupted as other industries are. And this might be one example of that. Amazon still says that they are in healthcare for the long run, and um, this was a trial and. They are, they've learned a lot and they're evolving and they're going to continue to look at healthcare as a, as a major part of what they're going to be doing now and in the, in the future. Yes, and obviously uh, part of their incremental improvements that they continue to derive, uh, failure is, is nothing but learning opportunities. I've certainly heard in other places and I think very much for them. I, I, I you know, I'll just emphasize that the point here and we've seen at least i've seen it repeatedly folks jumping into healthcare who say 
oh my goodness, this has to be easy to fix, only to discover that actually when you get on the inside, it's an awful lot harder, in part because it's very highly regulated. I mean, just as an example, I don't know that everybody knows this. I, I certainly didn't as a physician, but you can't just build a hospital. You you have to get authorization to do that. And, you know, most people, if I want to build a business to sell X, I just build a business and I start selling. I mean, I do need a license, but, you know, there's not, there's so many regulatory oversights and then there's an awful lot of complexity that's tied to all this matrix version of the care, the convoluted nature. So it, it is difficult. I'm with you. I don't think that they're stepping out, but it is kind of strange, you know, concurrent with the purchase at the same time that they move to sort of get rid of this. I would have thought that they might absorb it and, you know, maybe take some of the uh, learning and incorporate. I, I just, you know, that part of it is sort of somewhat strange to me. I'm not really sure why they did it the way they did, but maybe they got as much of it as they could and, uh, you know, moved on. So, but we'll watch and see. Um, on to lighter things, I think. Um, I was particularly uh, uh, blown away, uh, excited to see the uh, article that talked about psychedelics um, to treat alcoholism. Why am I excited about this? Well, I I've certainly been of the view that I think we've missed opportunities understanding psilocybin, which is one of the primary uh, psychedelics, magic mushrooms, but, you know, there are others. And because of the very strong response to the early days of, you know, the drug uh, 60s, um, you know, we turned against everything and said, you know, this is terrible. But in fact, what we've seen, and I've certainly seen with a number of papers, there was an outstanding one came out of New York that talked about psychedelics and psilocybin used to treat severe depression and people in terminal illness who struggle with that. And with one session guided... Um, importantly, in a, a setting that was appropriate and, and so forth, they managed to reverse all of the depression and permanently. So they didn't have to stay on these psychedelics. In this particular case, we're now seeing a little bit more research. So I think things are opening up. There's you know more potential I've seen certainly for PTSD, in this case for alcoholism, which does raise a little bit of a question. Are we switching one drug for another? But uh, equally, if you can Go from something that gives you relief from the addiction to alcohol, which is extraordinarily harming. I don't know where it falls in the category of uh, damage to people, but if we could change it and it's a non-permanent thing, so you don't have to continually uh, treat. But even if you did, if it was under a controlled circumstance, I think it would be great. Uh, if, if I was uh, struggling with that condition, I'd certainly be very uh, excited about it, and I'm excited about the scientific progress. Well, it's you know, it's great to kind of think outside the box, right? This is, I would say that uh, few folks, uh, at least, it doesn't seem obvious to me that that would be um, a, a, an experiment to try. Well, you're addicted to one drug. Let's let's try another. But it works, right? And uh, mm. or at least a preliminary kind of studies uh, show some some effectiveness and. and and it's worthwhile to kind of continue to talk about, you know, uh, the, <laughs> the way science works uh, is 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 very clear and obvious when uh, you look back uh, thirty or forty years later. Uh, but as as it's kind of moving forward, it's it's very confusing, and um, we've seen some of that in the last two or three years. And I think uh, scientists and, and and physicians have known this for a long time, and uh, the rest of us are figuring it out. So hey, if it works. Let's keep let's keep looking at it, making sure that it uh, it's not exchanging one problem for another. Right, and and I, you know, all, all respect to the folks that are trying to do this on a scientific basis. You know, I know there's a number of individuals, certainly organizations, that try and push the boundaries. And I, I don't want to call them out as inappropriate. I don't think they are. They're just struggling with the regulatory. Uh, surrounding. So they're sort of skirting around this, but there's a number of organizations that have taken this on and, you know, have actually constructed trials, created, um, you know, review boards, gone through IRBs um, and delivered against this, all 
uh, confronting the regulatory pressures that say you can't do anything. I mean, that was historically where we were. But, you know, we've seen it with marijuana. And I think there's been some progress, although I do think there seems to be a downside, which we're learning a little bit about marijuana, um, particularly with, you know, early onset use, which, you know, is perhaps happening, certainly based on my uh, walking around any city that uh, has uh, open access to marijuana. Um, I, I now understand the term skunk, which I never really understood until, <laughs> until then. Oh, I've got no comments. I, uh, <laughs> I don't know. You said when you're walking around some cities uh, that you know that uh, have uh, legalized marijuana. I think you could also walk around some cities where it's not, it's not as legalized <laughs> and still uh, still figure out that uh, it's widely available. Yes, I, 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 that's probably true. I'm just making an assumption just based on the fact that there has been some uh, relief to uh, the, the legality of that particular substance. So um, so on the inner city, one of the other things that uh, showed up in my news feed that I, I have to say I was just supremely disturbed by was this uh, drop in life expectancy. Uh, biggest drop we've seen since World War II, and not the first time. This is actually a trend, and the trend got worse, I think. Uh, what are your thoughts as an American? Well, yeah, well, um, <laughs> you know. He says like, sitting in America uh, and actually being an American but not sounding like one and wanting to take the high ground here somehow. <laughs> well, I'm, I'll try and use, just put on a British accent, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, but I'm not good at that. Good luck, uh, Jeeves. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, <laughs> Uh, life expectancy in the U.S. has dropped by uh, 1.8 years from 2019 to 2020. And um, to me, like, that's not what the most disturbing uh, uh, number is. The most disturbing that I'm, I'm reading an article here, um, it said that Hawaii currently has a life expectancy of 80.7 years, so almost 81 years. Well, Mississippi is at 71.9 years. So nine year differential between two states in the same in the same country. Um, that's kind of astounding. And, and so um, certainly we still see huge variations in life expectancy in the United States based on where you live um, and, and other factors that should in no way be determinative of, of, of your life. Uh, of how long you're going to live on, on average. So, you know, s certainly disappointing. Uh, obviously, a big chunk of this is is most likely due to to COVID. But, um, well, I shouldn't even say a big chunk. A chunk of this is due to COVID. I think I read somewhere maybe a third of this is due to COVID. And, and the rest is, um, is kind of up in the air and or multi, uh, definitely multifactorial. So, yeah, you know, we spend... Uh, more than almost everyone, if not everyone, and um, this is the return on investment that you get, and so it's not good. <laughs> it's, right. it's not. It's not good. Um, and, and and to be clear, just because I have a British accent, I live in the U.S., and what we've certainly learned about any of these um, trends and uh, impacts, you know, the same with obesity and heart disease. You, you can come from a healthy environment. So you could come from a blue zone, but if you come from a blue zone and start living in a non-blue zone, you inherit the non-blue zone um, negative impact. So, you know, it negatively impacts me, even if some other countries have improved. And, you know, to your point, I think it's, it's a better return on investment, not least of all because they pay much less money. Uh, for all of this healthcare, so um, already they're getting better value, but they're actually getting better results. A couple of things stood out to me that I think I, I, I would I, I don't fully understand or certainly can't explain. But we, we've been looking at this life expectancy drop for a while. But um, between 2019 and 2020, it hit Black and Hispanic people the hardest. Um, but 2020 to 2021 affected white people the most, uh, which, you know, I, I, as I try and think through the reasoning or, or the, the uh, elements of that, I'm not sure how to explain that. But I think we should really be spending a lot of time trying to work out what's contributing to this so that <laughs> we can turn it around. At least that's what I want. I mean... I ask people if they want to live forever, and it's funny. Not not everybody does, but I think that's because they think they're going to decline in health. But if you could live healthily, 
maybe not forever based on some of the Hollywood movies I've watched, but um, I think, you know, for the most part, I, I, I hey, I, I quite enjoy life um, if it's in a, a good quality of life and we can get to that point. I certainly buy into that concept. So um, perhaps we can move towards that. Um, so uh, relative to that, you know, one of the things that contributed and we, I, I think we did a good job. I'm, I, I, it's now past time um i have a sense that maybe we exported smoking to other countries but you know we've decreased the amount of smoking in this country and therefore reduced it although i did see uh something that really took me by surprise 15 percent of lung cancers in uh, our population have never smoked which i thought was very surprising so that there's obviously something else going on there but let's assume that we've dropped the the relative smoking we saw vaping. I've been a vociferous opponent to some of the um, marketing that took place. Uh, I took a lot of beating online at one point when I posted something complaining about the sweet flavors and bubble gum and so forth. And the FDA actually took this on, but apparently uh, they're not really enforcing it. That seems to be a recurring problem with... Um, uh, these regulations. We saw this perhaps with interoperability. Now we're seeing it with vaping. Yeah, well, um, you know, the the, the marketing uh, when it came online, what, maybe four or five years ago with, with Juul and, and others, um, was that, hey, these this is better than smoking. And so if you're currently smoking, then stop smoking cigarettes and, and start using, um, start vaping. And uh, it, it's not great for you, but it's 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 better than smoking, and and that may be true. But uh, for your point, lots of kids and lots of folks who never smoked and did, didn't use this as a tool to stop smoking actually just use it as a tool to to um, to increase all, all kinds of risks of, of lung disease and, and such. Um, FDA in the U.S. is has moments of brilliance and and also moments of. Um, Opportunity for improvement. Uh, <laughs> oh, see, so tactfully. I, I love it. <laughs> did you see how I did that? I'm learning. Oh, that was learning brilliant. Doctor, Doctor I could Nathan. definitely take take a leaf out of that book. As I get older, I learn things. And that's one thing <laughs> that I learned. Um, so, you know, I think uh, Jewel. Uh, so here, uh, um, FDA has done some good things. And so uh, uh, Jewel is um, um, not, uh, it's a shadow of what it was. And, and and um, I don't, I don't think it's quite bankrupt yet, but it's, uh, it's well on its way. And so um, that's good. So I, I don't think they're able to sell most of their products in the U.S. now, and, and that's good. The bad news is there's, there's lots of others that have taken over, and, and um, we, we'll anything that we can do to kind of, uh, you know, make sure that people use these tools where they make sense. Tools, I'm calling vaping a tool. Um, but most of it is, is, is just, you know, recreational um, of lung cancer, uh, ways of, of getting lung cancer. And, um, might take a little bit longer than smoking, but uh, it, sure enough, it's going in that, in that direction. So, yeah, I, 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 you know, baby steps and, and uh, we're, we're moving to the, you know, certainly 50 years ago, it was much easier to get cigarettes you could advertise on TV and in magazine or in, in um, uh on the radio and, and other places you can't, you can't now. Um, but boy, it, we have done a good job in the U S of, of decreasing it. And, um, uh, but it's, it's not going away. And as long as it's illegal, as long as it's legal, it's never going to go away. I, and even when it's illegal, I think it's still not going away. I mean, I, you're exactly right. I mean, it's, it's very easy to be, I think the term here is armchair armchair quarterback. Quarterback. That's the the, the one. Uh, you know, analyzing after the fact, and you know, huge respect for these people. They do uh, an exceptionally difficult job that you know encompasses regulation and things that I, I don't even begin to understand and would be challenged with. Um, and you know, have they they actually took this on, and I. I, I thoroughly applaud this. To be clear, I'm not anti-vaping as a treatment or off-ramp to smoking. It is absolutely better than that. Um, and what was a positive move for many folks, but um, the idea that we sucked in many of our youth was just, uh, to me, entirely wrong and needed to be stopped.
Unfortunately, as we do each and every week, uh, I've run out of time. Always a pleasure to uh, uh, hang out with you and uh, catch up. Uh, Craig, thanks for joining me today. It was a pleasure. Look forward to the next time. Thanks for joining me today. Do you have any better ideas or have you found a small incremental change that's brought about a big improvement in your world? Let's continue the conversation on our hashtag, The Incrementalist, or share with me at Dr. Nick One on Twitter. You can find more information about the show on our program page at healthcarenowradio.com. And tune in next time to hear my discussions with leaders and innovators from around the globe who've revolutionized their space by using small incremental improvements to achieve their moonshot. I'm Dr. Nick, the incrementalist, and I'm starting a revolution through evolution. 